Uh, all right. So thanks for coming, everybody. Uh, my name is Lily Mera. I've been writing Rust, at least as a hobby, since before the 1.0 release back in 2015. Uh, and I've been paid to write Rust at a software company called OneSignal since 2019. I'm the author of Refactoring to Rust, which is a, a new book published by Manning about integrating Rust into pre-existing legacy code bases uh, without rewriting them from scratch. Uh, so today we're going to be talking about how we can use open telemetry to monitor and observe the state of systems written in rust um, <clears throat> there's going to be a little bit of uh, theory stuff that we talk about first and then uh, we're going to jump into a little bit of live coding the first thing we need to talk about is what is open telemetry so open telemetry is a project of the cloud native computing foundation which is this uh, large sort of open source foundation that has a lot of projects under it and it's funded by basically every major cloud provider and every minor cloud provider. So everything from AWS, GCP, Azure to um, Baidu Cloud and, and Alibaba Cloud and you know, every, every company that's, uh, that's dealing in the cloud space. And OpenTelemetry itself is a standard for both uh, programming language APIs as well as uh, cross-system interchange for observability data. And this comprises uh, multiple different kinds of observability data, such as tracing and metrics and uh, logs. But I think the most sort of novel thing about this is tracing. And that is what we are going to be talking about today. So what is tracing? Uh, for those of you who have not used it before, let's, let's take a look at, at what that, that means. Um, there's two major concepts in tracing. There's a concept of a span, which is a period of time that an application is in some state or doing some action. And then there is a trace and a trace is a collection of spans that represents a single logical operation like uh, an HTTP or uh, RPC request handler. So I think it's, it's helpful to illustrate why spans are useful, why spans are good in contrast with uh, logs. So if we imagine some theoretical RPC handler system that exists out there, it might do these uh, series of operations. It might accept a request from some kind of client. It might run three sub requests concurrently, and then it might do some aggregation on those sub requests, and then it will send some aggregated response back to the client. So if we look at uh, what that system might look like if it were instrumented using logs, you know, this is sort of a timeline view and these are the, the times at which these log events would be produced. And then this is a, a list of those log events. So there's an event when we receive the request from the client. There are three events for when we fire off these three different uh, sub requests. And then there's an event for when we receive the first response from, uh, you know, system three, then system one, then system two. And then when we start the aggregation work, when we finish the aggregation work, and finally we ship off the response back to the client. Now, if we contrast this with the span data, you know, that has exactly the same timing, we can infer a lot more information from this span data just immediately by looking at it than we can from the log data. You know, each one of these states that the application is in, uh, it has a start, it has an end, and it has uh, some hierarchy to it. So all of these events right here are like children of the, uh, the request span because all of them are a part of the larger uh, request handling span. And immediately by looking at this, you know, we can tell that the longest RPC handler, or sorry, sorry the longest uh, span, the longest state that we're in is this R2 handler right here. So if we somehow, if we wanted to, or we needed to speed up our RPC system, we should probably spend our effort optimizing this R2 step right here. Probably not optimizing R3 because it's it's already the fastest thing. It's it's not going to get much faster probably. Or if it does get faster, we're not actually going to confer any benefit from that. Um, so it's not that this timing data isn't present on the logging events. Like obviously, virtually all logging systems are going to have timing information on them. You know, timestamps. The thing that we get from spans that we don't get from logs is a standardized way to communicate the hierarchy of events as well as the 
uh, start and end time of these spans. So, you know, all of these various uh, logs, you know, these all have a start and an end time. You know, this receive request and the send response, those are essentially the start and end timestamps for our, our big request span here. But the format of these is slightly different from the sending and receiving and the starting and finish here. So it, it's harder to derive as much meaning from the logs because they have a much more ad hoc format that, that's not standardized. Um, and logs are also not inherently hierarchical, they're inherently sort of individual. So you might imbue logs with some kind of hierarchy by attaching a request ID or something like that to all of them. But it's still not always, you know, you don't have the same level of correlation that you do with span data because you know, if you attached a request ID to all these log events, you would know that they were a part, you'd have the same amount of information as knowing that they were all part of the same trace, like this collection of spans, but you wouldn't necessarily know hierarchically that, you know, R1, R2, and R3 were, were children of the larger uh, request state. Um, Another big benefit that we get with tracing that we don't necessarily get with logs is using OpenTelemetry and, and many other tracing systems, we have inherently uh, distributable uh, data collection. So, you know, R2 is slow, we know that, but why is R2 slow? Like, that's a question that we can much more easily ask with a distributed tracing system like OpenTelemetry. We can instrument the RPC system that's handling R2 to figure out, you know, is it a database call that's unusually slow? Is uh, is this within you know the timing constraints of, of R2? Is it normally that slow? Is it uh, is it slow because one of its dependencies is slow? Uh, you know, is there just a, a DNS issue that's that's causing R2 to be slow? There's all kinds of issues that could be causing this RPC to be slow and by by using a distributed tracing system like OpenTelemetry, we can figure that out because we can tie all of the events that are happening within our two system back to this larger trace. And it's not illustrated here, but we are going to look at a, a live coding demonstration that does have uh, actual distributed traces. Um, that was a lot of theory. And I, I know that I've heard from the organizers that this is not typically a, uh, an event that has a lot of uh, audience interaction is mostly like sort of lecture based, but I do really like having audience participation questions. So if anyone has any questions, feel free to uh, dump those in the Zoom chat and I will interrupt myself and uh, try to get those answered. <clears throat> Otherwise, we can move on. So talking about distribution, you know, how how do we how do we distribute this tracing information from you know our theoretical system to whatever system is handling R two? We do that by using one of OpenTelemetry's standardized methods for trace propagation. So this is a, a diagram of a an HTTP header, HTTP header called the trace parent header, which I stole from a, a DoorDash engineering blog post. So every component of an open telemetry trace, including the trace itself, has a randomly generated ID. And those IDs are, are shoved into this HTTP header when uh, requests move from one service to another in a system. And then, you know, all the various pieces of the system can know about those IDs. So the, uh, the four components here, the version for now is always uh, zero, zero, because they haven't uh, I think the the RFC for this header hasn't like formally been accepted, so they haven't uh, haven't settled on a 1.0 version yet. But uh, that's always zero zero for now. The next component, the trace ID, is the identifier for the whole larger collection of spans. So like, if you have a uh, you know a customer sends your system a request, you know that request will have one trace ID for like the whole thing and then all of the various you know subsystems that are a part of your uh, part of your organization will share that trace ID but they'll have different uh, span IDs for their individual pieces. 
And then this parent ID here is the identifier for the span in the parent system. So back in our example here, you know, this, this trace, this collection of spans, it might have an ID that's one. And then this, uh, this R2 span, it's going gonna, it's gonna to have a, an ID of two. And then the, uh, the system that's handling that R2 request is going to receive a, uh, a header that looks like, you know, 00-1-2. And then this, uh, this final state, right, or this final component right here is a trace flags. And there's currently only one flag that's, uh, that's valid, which is the final bit. It can either be a, a 00 or a 01. And that is used for sampling decisions. So OpenTelemetry came out of some internal tracing tools that were developed at large companies like Uber, and they have just an enormous volume of events. And so they cannot possibly capture every single one of their events from every single one of their subsystems. So it's very common in large open telemetry installations to do very, very heavy sampling. Uh, at our company, we use open telemetry and we sample um, less than 0.1% of all of the events that we actually generate. So over 99% of the data that we generate just gets thrown directly away because it's impractical to, to store all of it. And the way that that's communicated is through these uh, flags right here. So 01 indicates that this span should be sampled and it should be sent up to whatever um, collection system you're using and zero zero indicates that it should not be sampled and it should just be thrown away and, and dealt with in the application's memory. Um, any questions about any of the theory stuff that we've talked about so far? All right. Yeah, you, sorry, you, um, you were talking about like how you throw away 99% of, of the sample data that you create, but presumably you can turn on the sampling for some of that data if you have a problem. Is that the case or would it always be thrown away? Yeah, that's a great question. So there are a lot of different ways that you can do sampling. So for some some companies, what they will do is their this header right here, the very root level of this header at least, will be generated by their like load balancer, like Nginx or HAProxy, something like that. So at the load balancer level, when a request first comes into their uh, system, they'll they'll you know set version zero zero. They'll generate a random trace ID, generate a random parent ID, and they will randomly either set the thing to be sampled or or not sampled. So you know you could do that with just a random number generator that has a very very low chance of being zero one. Um, another way, and actually the way that that we do it internally is we actually use a, a vendor tool called uh, Refinery, which is an open source program created by a company called uh, Honeycomb, which is a uh, company that stores and visualizes uh, trace data for, for their customers. Um, and what Honey, uh, sorry, what, what Refinery does, it's, it's really interesting. It actually collects all of the tracing data for all the systems, um, and it looks at all of the properties of those traces and it actually like finds interesting values uh, of the traces finds unique values of some of these fields that we have told it are important and it will you know ship up the unique the interesting values and throw away the stuff that's non-unique so you know the one endpoint that we have that gets called um you know 200 million times a day it's gonna it's going to, you know, throw away a really large percentage of the 200s that come into that endpoint. But if we get 500s or 503s or something like that, it'll say like, oh, there's hardly any of these. So let's let's ship them out um, to the, the upstream system. So that's a more like dynamic sampling method that can be used. But a lot of companies, a lot of installations, I think, are just using, like I said, uh, their load balancer or some upstream system to do like true RNG um, sampling decisions. Um, and then I see there's also a couple questions in the chat. So any flags besides 00 and 01. So for now, those are the only two uh, flags that exist. So 
you know, it's, it's a flag field, uh, a, a two digit flag field. So, you know, theoretically there are, um, lots of valid flags that could be thrown in there, but the standard just doesn't include them yet. Um, because they haven't really thought of other flags that would be necessary. Sampling is like the, the thing that is most common. Um, and then there's another question. Could I relate the trace ID parents with R1? Could yeah, please... I mean, the, these, um, you had a diagram with R, R1, R2, R3. I'm, I'm just trying to relate how the header and the parent and the trace ID relate to the individual spans in here. Yeah, so that's a good question. So uh, like, like I was saying before, so this whole thing, all of these spans are going to have the same um, trace ID because they're all part of the same like single logical operation. But each one is individually going to have its own span ID that represents, you know, just this uh, one individual span, this one individual period of time. And every span, so I guess every span has three IDs on it, right? It has the trace ID, it has its own ID, and it has a parent ID. And that's how we communicate uh, hierarchy. So this R1 span is going to have its parent uh, span ID set to the span ID of the request span. Same with the R2 span, it'll it'll have its parent set to the request span, R3 is parented to the request span. And this aggregation span will also be parented on the request span. There's not a whole lot of hierarchy that's going on in this diagram. This is a pretty simple trace. But if we imagine that, you know, R2 is also being backed by some complex system that has its own uh, tracing data, its own spans, um, you know, at the time that we send out our two RPC requests to its remote system, you know, we would gather all those IDs. We would say, okay, this big trace has ID one, the R2 span has ID two. Um, so let's take those IDs, let's serialize them onto this HTTP header and we'll throw them across the wire. And then whatever RPC system is running, uh, you know, the, the R2 request, it will, deserialize that HTTP header, inject it into its own tracing system, and every span that it creates will have the same trace ID as this trace, and they will, like the, the root span that it creates will be a child of this uh, R2 span right here. It'll have its parent ID set to uh, the ID of the R2 span. Is that? Okay. Yeah, th thanks. And, and you mentioned the uh, the information is serialized and sent. So would that be sent on this header on somewhere on this? Yeah, so that, that would be serialized on this HTTP header, which is, um, is, is always called trace parent. And, you know, it, you can also shove it into like gRPC metadata or, you know, basically any other serialization medium that, that you're using for your requests. So, you know, this might be, uh, you might shove this into a, uh, Kafka message header, you might shove it into uh, a Redis pub sub system. There, there's, you know, virtually limitless ways that you could exchange this uh, between various systems. It's just, you know, a standardized way to represent this remote trace context. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. All righty. So now I would like to uh, tell you all a story. This is a story about uh, wrangling some Rust services to get them to uh, work as expected. So part of the story is background and part of it is a live coding demonstration that we're going to do. So you arrive for your first day as a new Rust developer at a company called MathCo. MathCo develops arithmetic software that serves as the calculation background for Fortune 500 companies, or at least that's what their hiring page told you. And as the new technical fellow, you have been tasked with debugging their main reverse Polish notation arithmetic system. It seems that there's a bug in it somewhere that is eluding the ops team and everyone else that they throw at it. Now, you ask around and you say, how does this system work? You know, it's a reverse Polish notation calculator. You know, that, that's in a lot of introductory programming books. Surely it's, it's got to be a relatively simple system, right? It's just, it's just doing arithmetic. 
and it doesn't even have to do precedence because it's it's reverse Polish notation. Now your manager responds, well, it was simple, but I went to the uh, Cloud First Nano Services conference last year, and we re-architected it to uh, make it much more scalable. Now you start to get a little bit concerned when you hear this. You say, okay, so we split arithmetic into microservices. I don't really understand why, but uh, I guess that's the system that we've got now and we gotta fix it. So is there a service diagram anywhere? And you're told, yes, there is a service diagram. And your manager proudly points you to this out of focus picture of a pink post-it note with red writing on it that has a water stain on it. And you realize that your job is gonna be harder than you thought. Now this, this documentation, if you can even call it that, is uh, woefully inadequate. And before we can attempt to fix the system, we need to first understand how it works, how are messages exchanged between systems, what's the dependency of what. We're gonna do this by instrumenting the system with open telemetry tracing. Uh, so let us jump over into the code. Thankfully, uh, we were provided with a readme that gives us uh, some, some reasonable amount of documentation that we can use. So we are told that we can start up all of the services using this, uh, this run command. So let's go ahead and do that now. And we're also provided with a curl command that we can use to test the system. Let's go ahead and try executing that now. Of course, it doesn't have a new line, so let me, let me go ahead and add that. So we have this calculation, and it returns 6. I'm not sure if that's right. So for the purposes of testing and also uh, uh, showing folks how reverse Polish notation works, if you're not familiar, let's uh, go through that right now. So reverse Polish notation works on a stack machine. Basically, if we encounter a number, we add it onto the stack. If we encounter an operator, we pop the two preceding things off the stack and we do that operation on them. So let's let's build up the stack. So we have three, then we get to four, then we have a plus. So we'll pop the three and four. Uh, so. We, uh, we put a three on the stack, we put a four on the stack, we see a plus, so we, we pop the three and four off and we add them together. And of course, three plus four is seven, and then we, uh, we put the seven onto the stack. We see a two, we put a two on the stack. We pop, we pop the two off, we pop the seven off. Seven minus two is five. We see a three, we put the three on the stack. We see a times, three times five is 15. We see another three, we put the three on the stack. We see a divider and 15 divided by three is five. Uh, so we should expect to see five back from our system. But unfortunately, when we run our curl request, we actually get back six. So this is demonstrating that uh, arithmetic bug that exists somewhere within our system that we need to track down. So let's look at the uh, the file structure here. There is a top level cargo.toml and it shows us that this is a cargo workspace that has uh, six different crates in it. Add, calculator, div, mole, services, and sub. So I'm, I'm gonna infer based on what, uh, what bad documentation did exist that uh, we have add, mole, div, and sub, and uh, calculator is sort of an overarching service that, that shells out to these individual operators to perform some individual arithmetic operation. Um, so let's, uh, let's try to confirm that. So we have calculator here. It looks like this actually has uh, a stack machine. And okay, it's actually doing the string parsing. 
and then it's calling out to these individual services to do addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. In addition to that, there's also a services crate, and it looks like that's being used to sort of build up the uh, to both build up the server side to start the server and also oops and also to uh, serve as the common uh, HTTP client that the services are using to talk to each other. So this, this calculation client is coming also from that services crate. So this is going to make our job uh, a bit easier since we do have a common dependency where we can add our uh, tracing stuff to. So we're going to start with the, the server side piece of that. So looking at that server uh, run function that was being called in the, uh, in the calculator main, we can see that it's starting up a, uh, an Actix web HTTP server. And we're being passed a, uh, a closure that's building up an Actix web app. And what we're going to do is we are just going to add some middleware onto this, this app that's returned from this app builder closure that's going to do the, do the business of tracing. So we are going to need to include some additional crates beyond what's in here uh, right now. And I'm just going to sort of unceremoniously dump these in for now, but uh, we will be uh, coming back to all of these crates and talking about them in, in more detail, sort of structurally, in a moment. So don't worry too much about that. Uh, so this app builder is going to be returning an Actix Web app. So I'm going to call dot wrap on this and pass it and Actix Web Open Telemetry Request Tracing Middleware. And this is going to start producing open telemetry spans um, every time a HTTP route is being handled by the Actix Web route or the Actix Web uh, app. And then in order to actually ship those spans off somewhere useful, we have to configure a couple of globals within the OpenTelemetry library uh, itself. So there's lots of different places that you can ship span data off to. You can print it on standard output. You can send it to a, a SaaS company like uh, Honeycomb or um, Datadog or something like that. But we are going to be using a, a self-hosted tool called Jaeger today. And there is another crate called OpenTelemetry Jaeger that links the OpenTelemetry crate to uh, an exporter that ships its data off to the Jaeger service. So we are going to go ahead and start, start that up in here. Again, OpenTelemetry Jaeger new pipeline, and this is essentially just a, a builder that we can use to configure all kinds of different attributes. Install simple is like the, the final build piece of that pipeline. And we can use everyone's favorite rest air handling method unwrap on that. And unfortunately, there was there is one uh, thing that we do have to configure beyond just uh, starting up the builder. Um, so I mentioned previously sampling decisions. So by default, uh, OpenTelemetry and OpenTelemetry Jaeger are configured to only sample things that uh, are already that have already been sampled. So like thinking back to the uh, the header that I showed you, by default, the OpenTelemetry Rust library is only going to ship off spans that had this flag set to one some upstream system said hey go ahead and, and sample this uh this span it's not it doesn't decide on its own to uh to sample things so we need to change that and we can do that 
by uh, calling oops, calling a different builder method on this pipeline with trace config. And we're going to pass it an open telemetry config telemetry no sorry that is not the right path to be using config default with sampler sampler always on and then we'll let my Rust Analyzer plugin sort out the imports. Nice. So this is going to tell the Open Telemetry library, hey, every single event that you see, assume that it's sampled and forward it to to Jaeger. So this is different from how it normally operates, which is to accept the sampling decisions of upstream systems and not choose to sample something that is is not sampled. So if this were a part of a larger a uh, system that had like a load balancer in front of it or some other thing that was making these sampling decisions, we wouldn't need this. Uh, but for our very simple uh, cluster setup, we, we do need this. So I'm now going to send uh, my request again, and it's still going to respond with six, but we should now also be shipping our data off to Jaeger. So let's, let's jump over to Jaeger which is a, a web application um, has a an HTML front end. And this is this is what their UI looks like when you first come to it. We have this beautiful search panel over here that allows us to slice and dice up our, our trace data however we want to. So we're going to start by picking a service. Uh, we're going to give this a, a more fine grained service name in, in a minute. But to start out with, everything is configured to to say that the service is open telemetry, open telemetry library. And then underneath that, we can actually uh, sample these or uh, slice and dice these things down to the name of the span that's, uh, that's happening. So the calculate route is the HTTP handler that is called at the top level. So let's search for that. And we can see now a very, uh, very well key value paired uh, span for this calculate handler that has absolutely no children and no hierarchy to it whatsoever. So this is somewhat interesting. You know, we could derive some timing data, some P99s, probably some, some nice charts from just this, but it doesn't actually really help us with our debugging investigation whatsoever. And that is because we are not, uh, we're not forwarding the tracing information between systems. We're only setting up new traces uh, from the server's uh, perspective. So we could actually you know, change this to, to show us all operations and search. And we can see there's individual traces, individual whole traces for all these various systems. And you know, we want everything to be tied together into, into one logical span. Uh, we don't want individual traces for every single operation. So let us take care of that uh, right now. And the way that we're going to do that back in the code is by adding middleware to the HTTP client uh, and not just the server. So at the time that our client sends off its post requests to the, uh, the other systems in our, our little microservice cluster. We want it to get the ID of the current span, get the ID of the current trace, and serialize that trace parent header. And we can do that by uh, adding this trace request uh, function call onto our, uh, our request builder. And this is coming out of the Actix Web Open Telemetry library just like our uh, server middleware was. So if we rerun this request uh, now, it's going to fail because uh, the services are still building. Ah, yes, uh, there's a, a question in the Zoom chat. How did you connect the web app to Jaeger? 
That is a very good question. So all of these systems are running inside of Docker Compose. Jaeger is one of those uh, services that's running in Docker Compose. Um, and then all of the services have these uh, Jaeger environment variables uh, specified. So they are pointing, pointing to the uh, Jaeger container and they're pointing to the appropriate uh, port for collecting the span data. I'm sorry, I should have mentioned that uh, earlier. Thank you. Uh, okay, so that probably should have been enough time for Rust to recompile. So if I resend this request, okay, we're getting six once again. Um, let's jump back over to Jaeger. Let's find some more traces. Hmm. Okay, if we look at our calculate. If you look at our calculate operation right now, we see the client spans from when it sent off the post request to the other services, but it doesn't look like those other services actually uh, accepted. Ah, the other services still created their own uh, spans. They didn't get associated and that's because I, I left out a step, which is in the uh, in the server startup, there is there is an extra step, which is you actually have to tell OpenTelemetry how it should propagate the span information <clears throat> from from client to server. And I see there's a request to increase the font size on Jaeger as well, so I will do that. So um, yeah, we have to tell OpenTelemetry how it should propagate uh, from client to server. Uh, it, it, there's a lot of different methods that, that can be used for doing that. And unfortunately it doesn't have one configured by default. So we have to call uh, another method to set up that global open telemetry, global set text map propagator. Trace context propagator new, and then uh, you know, it has a similar method, get text, map, get text map propagator, and that is called from both the, the clients and the servers to figure out how to pull the trace context um, off the wire. And this trace context propagator, it knows about that uh, trace parent header that, that we talked about earlier. Um, so I should now be able to rerun this request. And this time, uh, we should actually get uh, the, the tracing data that we care about in Hager. OK, so now we see this, this trace that was generated a few seconds ago has 17 spans on it, which is, is far more than the, the traces that we had earlier. So we could see now there are all kinds of spans on here. So the calculate service sends a post to the add service. The ad service has its own span in there, it goes to sub. But this is kind of hard to read because everything, everything is, is being assumed to be a part of this larger open telemetry service. Um, so what we, what we actually want is we want all of the microservices that we have to have their own service name and not just be called open telemetry. So let's, uh, let's configure that now. Yes, so service names. So there is a uh, service name variable that's also available on all these uh, Docker containers. So we are going to co-opt that for our purposes here. And I can just call another method on this uh, builder in order to set that up with service name. Of course, we can call standard and var environment variables and that's uh, that's going to be available inside all of our little service containers and we'll give it a moment to rebuild it looks like it should be running 
Okay, now it is finished. So now we actually have multiple service names that actually do correlate with all of the services that exist in our, our cluster. So I'm gonna set the service name to calculator, which recall is the sort of top level service that uh, we have. And now we can see the breakdown of spans per service in this trace. So we can see there are five operations that happened in the add service, five operations from the calculator service, Oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't. I did not switch uh, over to Jaeger. Thank you for calling me out. Um, five operations in the add service. Five operations in the calculator service. Um, one from div. Four from all. Two from sub. So let's open this up. We can see now we have a much more uh, colorful view. We have uh, uh, pretty easy to identify. You know which span is coming from which service because it's. it's prefixed over here on the left side and as well as you know having its own uh, span color in this sort of timeline view that's over here on the right. So let's look at how some of these uh, services are working. So calculator, you know, it sends a post to the ad service and the ad service does an operation that makes enough sense. And then calculator sends a post to the subservice and then the subservice also sends a post to add, which is a little strange. Okay, and then the mole service, it looks like sends repeated post requests to the add service, which I suppose if you think about how multiplication works is a, a reasonable enough, uh, reasonable enough way to do that, but it, it's certainly odd, given that the language has easier facilities for doing multiplication than that. And then finally the div service. It, uh, it does its own division and doesn't need anything else. Uh, so this is this is a little strange. Let's let's dive into this uh, subservice and the mole service to see how they're implemented, because you know they're they're calling out from themselves to the add service, which is certainly not how I would implement these services from scratch uh, if I had the option. So let's jump over to the code. Let's look at how this uh, subservice is implemented. And so it looks like sub is actually implemented in terms of addition, which is technically valid as subtraction is the inverse of addition, but it's it's odd and it's it's not how you would probably think to implement subtraction if you were starting it from scratch. But you know, joining a new job that that has uh, you know, preset architectures. We don't always get to design things from scratch the way that we would want to. So this is this is what we've got. And then let's look at uh, mole to see how multiplication is being done. Interesting. So multiplication is actually implemented in terms of repeated addition, which is technically valid because that that is how multiplication works. It's it's repeated addition. But uh, once again, it's kind of strange, and it's not how we would architect this if we were starting over from scratch. Um, so I'm sort of curious about this one to see if if maybe uh, multiplication might be the problem. I'm a little bit less confident about that one than I am on subtraction. So let's see if we can add some more instrumentation to this to try and figure out exactly what this is doing to confirm if this is is working yes or no. Uh, so we're going to do that by using the tracing library uh, as opposed to the open telemetry library. From a, a user's perspective, uh, I think the tracing library is, is a little bit easier to use. Tracing is a, a, a facade library uh, similar to the log crate. Um, if, you've, if you've used the log crate before, you know, the log crate doesn't actually you know, print a standard out or ship logs to Datadog or anything like that by default. It just does nothing. So if you're writing a library, you would use the log crate to create log events. And then people who are running your library as a part of their application would configure a global logger to take all those events and ship them off somewhere as the application developers desire. So similar to that, you know, the tracing library is a facade. 
It doesn't do anything by default. You have to configure a global tracing subscriber that accepts the events and ships them off to whatever uh, tracing provider you care about. But the difference between tracing and log is that you know tracing uh, can, can deal with span data and it can deal with event data and it can also um, store key value data, which you know logs are the, the log crate currently only deals with uh, formatted strings in its uh, in its standardized API. They do have an unstable key value API, but I don't think it's it's been in, uh, finalized yet. So let us add tracing to the mole service. We're going to add the 0 0.1, which is the, the latest version of the tracing crate to mole. And then we're going to do a couple things. The first thing we're going to do is add a tracing span around this whole mole function right here. And we can do that by using an attribute macro that tracing provides called instrument. And this is going to wrap our entire function inside of a tracing span so that any events or any spans that we generate with tracing inside of this function are uh, associated with that uh, span around the whole thing. And it's also going to, like for free, serialize the arguments that the, the mole function is passed and put them on that span. And then, uh, Within the function, we're also going to generate a tracing event, the info level, and we are going to print. We are going to emit the x value, the y value, uh, which are the two the two things being multiplied together, and we're also going to emit the uh, the total, the final result of our multiplication. So x, y, total, and we'll call this event null finished null uh, result so this is going to give us the x the y and the total as uh, key value pairs and null result as the name and it's going to be associated with this tracing uh, span that's wrapping the whole null function and if we configure everything right, that tracing span will itself be a child of the open telemetry spans that we're generating, and it will also get forwarded to uh, to Jaeger. So let us make these two uh, create ecosystems play nice with each other. So we can do that once again by configuring a couple of uh, globals within this time the tracing uh, ecosystem. So the first thing we need to do is actually capture the, the tracer that's being uh, built here instead of just uh, letting, it, letting it pass by. And then we're going to pass this tracer into uh, another crate, which is tracing open telemetry, which hooks together the tracing ecosystem and the, uh, the open telemetry ecosystem. Sorry, I guess I should have turned off those little pop-up boxes. Um, so we're, we're going to configure a tracing open telemetry layer and pass it the, uh, the tracer that we created earlier. And then we're going to take this layer and we're going to pass it to a tracing subscriber that we build with the tracing subscriber crate. And then we're going to pass that subscriber to um, the tracing crates set uh, global default function. We don't need to store that. As well. Set global default subscriber 
and they have to do an unwrap on them. Yes, and then this width is actually coming out of a uh, extension trait from tracing subscribers. That's tracing subscriber prelude. Okay. Uh, there's a lot of lines here and a lot of different crates with a, a lot of functions in them. We're going to be looking at the, the architecture of those in, in just a minute. But uh, first, I would like us to, uh, to see the fruits of this uh, complicated nesting of crates. OK, so we got our six back. Let us jump over to Jaeger and see what we've got in here. Uh, so we see there's now one more span on this uh, this newer trace that we have, 18 spans instead of 17. Let's open this up. This is the mole span that was generated from the tracing uh, library. You can see that we get a couple couple attributes for free on here. We get uh, the file path, the line number, the crate name and module path if it's applicable. This is, of course, not in any module of the mole crates. We just get mole in here. Um, and then the values. Values is the name of the, uh, the argument that was passed to the mole function. We can see that that's, that's serialized on our span sort of for free, like we didn't have to do anything else to get that. And then within our uh, mole span, we get our mole result event. And we can see that uh, our key value pairs are x equals 5, y equals 3, so 5 times 3 equals 20. OK, 5 times 3 is not 20. So our bug is, is definitely, well, maybe not the whole bug, but one bug is definitely inside of this mole crate. And we need to figure out uh, why, why is mole working wrong? Why is it not multiplying? five times three equals 20. So let's add a little bit of, of extra instrumentation in here. So we can see that there are some repeated calls to this add uh, function. Let's go ahead and uh, let's go ahead and, and uh, print out, or not print out, let's emit some, some tracing events for all of those ads. Oh, sorry, so we're we're adding total to x. So let's do x and total. And I'm going to run this. We get a network error. So that network error actually uh, raises something interesting, which is uh, what what happens when there is a inter-service communication breakdown with uh, some instrumented services. So if we look in, in Jaeger right now, we can see that there's actually this span that has this highlighted uh, two errors thing on it. So I'd like to jump in here. If we look at this span timeline, we can see that this, this bottom one here, this post to the mole service has this nice big warning uh, bubble on it. If we expand that, look in the tags, see that there was a, an error from the Actix client library that says connection refused. So, you know, just sort of for free by virtue of configuring all this stuff, we, uh, we can figure out why this individual request to the, the calculate service failed. We can figure out that it's because this post to the mall service failed because that, that service was being rebuilt and uh, restarted. So I think that that's really nice. That's uh, something that would be maybe a bit harder to, to track down with logs why an individual request failed because one of its dependencies was down. Okay. But uh, I reran the curl command and uh, it, it did now work this time. So let's uh, let's find the span for that. And traces. There is our success span. And let's uh, let's take a look at these events that are in here. So remember that we're adding 
total plus x. So 5 plus 5 is 10. Oops. 5 plus 5 is 10. 10 plus 5 is 15. 15 plus 5 is 20. All of those things are true, but we shouldn't actually be doing this final uh, total, this, this final addition step right here. 15 plus 5 isn't something that we should be doing. We should have stopped uh, after this one. So we have a, a classic off by one error in our uh, multiplication logic. Let's, uh, let's take another look at the code and see if we could figure out why that's happening. We initialize total to x, so we initialize total to 5, and then we loop y times, we loop 3 times. So we start out with 5, and then we add 3 more 5s on top of that. So that's essentially that, that's 5 times 4. So we could fix that in a couple ways. But let's just uh, go ahead and make, let's initialize total to, uh, to 0 instead of x. And that should solve our uh, one too many additions problem. So indeed, if we uh, rerun the handler now, we see that we get our, our output of five, which is exactly what we expected from when we, we manually ran through our, uh, our stack machine earlier. And if we jump back over to Jaeger and take a look at the, uh, the latest trace that we got, you can see that mull, mull looks correct. So zero plus five is five, five and five is 10, 10 and five is 15. And then our mole result shows that x, I'm oh, sorry, 5 times 3 gave us uh, 15 as the output. OK. So we just covered a lot of stuff. There were a lot of uh, crates that I used. And I know that I, I sort of teased uh, a more theoretical architectural look at some of those crates that we never got. So let us let's, uh, do that now. This is uh, the sort of architecture of what one of these instrumented services uh, looks like at a, a pretty high level. So in our, in our applications, you know, we have these calls to like tracing info. We have the Actix Web Open Telemetry Trace Request function, Actix Web Open Telemetry Request Tracing, new middleware. And both of these are going to be creating events and, and feeding events into these like crate ecosystems that exist, the tracing ecosystem, the open telemetry ecosystem. So when we emit this uh, tracing event using the tracing crate, it's going to go into the tracing crate that will look for the globally configured uh, tracing subscriber, which we have configured using the tracing subscriber crate. And that subscriber is hitting the tracing open telemetry crate, which is using the globally configured uh, tracer that's in the open telemetry library, which is hitting open telemetry Jaeger. And then that goes over to the, uh, the Jaeger span trace collector that's running in our Docker Compose network. And similarly, with the uh, Actix Web open telemetry, it's sending events into or it, you know, these middlewares are running some code from the Actix Web Open Telemetry uh, library, which feeds into the Open Telemetry tracer, goes to Open Telemetry Jaeger, and then to Jaeger. So these two like crate ecosystems are basically separate from each other, and the only thing that's connecting them is this tracing Open Telemetry library right here. So this end library might be a, a wide variety of things. You know, it might be spitting events out to standard output, you know, formatted with JSON. It might be spitting them out to some uh, vendor specific tracing library. There's all kinds of, of uh, subscribers that could be used in here to format these trace events and ship them out. Um, yeah, so that's a, that's a high level look at, at what these services look like and how these events make it through all of those various uh, crates that, that we configured. Um, are there any questions about, about this or the code or, or Jaeger or anything that we sort of touched on today? That was most of the content that I had to chat about with folks, but I'm happy to, happy to answer questions if, if there are any. Yeah, uh, so you, 
right now you are sampling everything. Mm -hmm. Is there anything on the at the tracing crate level or, or anything from the application code on this info or, or, or on the spans on the application that can be used to decide whether the current span needs to be sampled? Yeah, so that's a, that's a great question. Um, so the way that these uh, libraries work is hmm, the open telemetry crate it, it only has a couple of different sampling options that are built into it. So if we look at the, the API docs for, for open telemetry, um, it comes with this sampler enum that you can uh, that you can provide. So the, the default, I think, is this parent-based one. And it will uh, it, I think the default is parent-based. And the internal thing is always off, so it will say, you know, use the parent traces sampling decision or use the parent spans sampling decision, or if there is no parent, then do not sample. But uh, this thing, this enum that they provide, is just uh, you know something that's that's there out of the box. You can also configure it to use a, a ratio, a random number generator, or you can also write your own custom dynamic sampler uh, using this should sample trait. And you can you know, inspect the arbitrary key value pairs that are on the span. You can inspect all of the links, all of the parents, all the children. Um, so if you want to write your own thing, you can use this should sample trait, or you can use um, some kind of dynamic sampling service outside of the application like a refinery that I uh, alluded to earlier. That's a good one. Other questions? Um, how much more is there of the um, tracing crate? Like, so you can you you've shown us an example of um, you know instrumenting this uh, service that you've got here. How much more is there to know of tracing itself? Is it? fairly self-contained? Have, have we seen most of it already or is it like a much bigger? System? Yeah, so it's a, it's a pretty large uh, crate ecosystem and there are, there are lots of, of different sort of options and configurations for subscribers that you can do. And then uh, the, the one other piece that, that there is that I, I didn't really show you is how you can sort of manually construct a span. So we looked at how you can use this attribute macro to like automatically wrap a function in a span. You know, this is just a, a convenience method. Um, similar to the uh, event macros, there are also span macros that you can use. So we could create a span. And let's say, you know, let's imagine that this a uh, client thing right here we're not doing it's did not have its own span that was being generated as a part of it um, so you know maybe we want to call this the perform addition span we're going to give it uh you know x and y sorry x and uh yeah, let's say we, we didn't want an event here, we wanted a span, and we wanted to store x and total on there. So we can construct a span with, with tracing info span, or there's also you know all the various uh, levels, debug, error, warn, trace. Um, and then there's a couple different ways that you can like say that you can you know present the timing information for these uh, spans. Um, for a for an async context like this, where we're, we're calling an async function, we would need to call this instrument method on the future. And that's a part of a, uh, a extension trait that the tracing library has, and this will this will give us you know accurate timing information for the the future, and it will. Uh, propagate the, the parent information correctly as the future is being pulled. So, you know, even if we had tons of futures being uh, pulled concurrently, uh, 
this would this would ensure that uh, the spans were always lined up right. If we were not in an async context, we weren't we weren't using a, a wait, then we could do something slightly simpler than that, which is we could call um, entered. And you know this is oops, this returns like a, a drop guard. So this assumes that when this guard goes out of scope, um, when the guard is dropped, then the, the span has ended. So if this were like a, a synchronous method, we would uh, we would use that. Oh, it's spiked. And then I guess there, there is one there's one other sort of neat thing that we can do with these spans uh, that, that I didn't talk about, which is we can uh, record a field on a span after the time it's generated. So I could set results to, what is this thing called? I need to look it up. I wasn't, wasn't thinking that I would talk about this. Thank you. What's that? Is it is it the field empty? Ah yes, thank you. Tracing tracing field empty, and then um, you know this this is just like the result field is just not going to be reported. But um, after we get the result and we store it in total, I can say span dot record um, results total. And then this is actually going to oh, borrow of moved value span. We can uh, borrow this here. If that works. No. We can clone it. Um, yeah, so then this this will uh, store the result of the addition in addition <laughs> addition to uh, the things going into it. So if we we run our request handler again and uh, we jump over to Jaeger and we pull this up, yeah, you can see perform addition zero plus five is five. That's a, a neat thing that's uh, that's available in tracing, and you can you could use that if you were you know if you were using this around like a, say uh, an RPC handler to uh, you know record the status code that was coming back in addition to the the inputs to the RPC handler. Try to read this question from Rodrigo. Um, is it a good practice to open a span for every function in your service, like I did? Um, okay, I'm sorry, my my chat window is is unusually small, and I can't figure out why. Okay, like you did for mul function, this can cause overhead or increase the response time for some of the requests. Is it possible to set some global configuration, and it will be responsible to automatically create a span for every function in the service? Um, it's it's probably not reasonable to add a span for every single function in your service. Like you know, if this were if this were a, a you know real service, like it wouldn't just be doing addition and exiting, or, or multiplication and exiting. You know, it would be calling it would be calling databases. It would be looking things up, and you know those kind of longer running operations that might slow down. You know, you might want to put spans around those to try and figure out their timing information, and if they slow down. Um, but you know, in memory operations that are going to be really fast, you probably don't want to put a span around those because, you know, like you said, that would slow it down. That would have some overhead. Um, that being said. The tracing crates, the open telemetry crates, they are designed to be extremely low overhead where possible. Um, so like if you have a if you have a span that is not sampled, for example, if if it's uh, if it has its sampling header set to zero, it will essentially be a no-op through the entire uh, you know ecosystem. 
to to create that. I mean, I think there's a couple there's a couple lookups, maybe a hash table calculation, but uh, beyond that, it's going to be really really low overhead to to create those spans. So, uh, I don't think it's 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 not too big of a deal to to add this instrumentation. I mean, we're, we're talking on the order of like nanoseconds uh, to to create these spans. And in terms of retention of data in uh, Jaeger. Mm -hmm. So is there anything there cleaning up all the information? Uh, is this something automatically done or you need to take care of that? Yeah, so that's a little bit beyond the scope of this talk. Um, you know, Jaeger has lots of different ways that it can store information. Uh, for the purposes of this demo, it's just storing everything in memory. So it, it flushes out pretty regularly. But uh, you can use other kinds of data stores like uh, Elasticsearch, I think S3. Um, it has a lot of different backends that can be configured, and I think it, it allows you to configure whatever kind of retention rules you want, you know, as your storage budget allows. Okay, thanks. Thank you so much, Lily, for doing that. Uh, that was a really interesting talk. Yeah, thanks, everyone. Thanks for, for hosting me, Russ Dublin. It was uh, nice, uh, nice talking with all of you, and uh, yeah, I hope, that, uh, hope this was interesting and hope it was helpful for folks. It was really good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Take care. Thank you. Bye.